recording. Well, um, again, welcome everyone to uh, another RN webinar. Uh, the Refugee Research Network webinar series is designed to bring together refugee and forced migration researchers from the global south and the global north, along with practitioners, policymakers, and people with experiences of displacement. Uh, in each webinar session, we report on current research projects and dig deeper into the different knowledge mobilization aspects, practices, and tools um, that, th th that were pursued. The aim is to engage in a dialogue about ways to transform research into practice. And the title of the current webinar is Localizing Knowledge Production, Shifting Power in Forced Migration Studies. And I am really looking forward to introducing our guests in a few minutes. Again, I am your moderator, Dina Taha. And before we start, it's, um, it's always a tradition to start with land acknowledgement. But since we are, our meeting is held online and it's, we're not located in a singular geographical location, but since the Refugee Research Network is located at York University in Toronto, we would like to share the land acknowledgement that's used by York University. Uh, and we invite you today to consider your own territory. So the Refugee Research Network acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tikaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lake region. And now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce um, the, the founder and the mastermind behind the Refugee Research Network, Professor Susan McGrath. Uh, Susan McGrath is Professor Emerita and Senior Scholar at the School of Social Work at York University. She served as the Director of the Center for Refugee Studies from 2004 to 2012. Uh, she's also the past president of the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration and a founding member of the Canadian Association for Refugee and Forced Migration Studies. Professor Susan McGrath was awarded the 2015 Shirk Partnership Impact Award for forging innovative, interdisciplinary, equitable, and cross-sector partnerships, and in 2014 was invested into the Order of Canada in recognition of her outstanding achievement in research and policy on refugee rights. And uh, again, she is the founder and the moving force behind the Refugee Research Network. Susan, it's a pleasure to be here with you and over to you. Thank you, Dina. And thanks to you and Irene Osmond, Michelle Millard and Learn Team members, particularly Jennifer Kenji, Kenji and Rachel McNally for helping to organize this webinar. And it's the fifth in our series of webinars on refugee research. As noted, the Refugee Research Network is a global network of academics, students, and practitioners built around relationships among 13 refugee research centers and funded by the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. My colleague, Julie Young, who's on the call, a Canada Research Chair at the University of Lethbridge, and I have published an edited collection that seeks to capture and reflect on how the RN tried to build networks for knowledge production and mobilization what we were able to accomplish together as well as the challenges. And the book, Mobilizing Global Knowledge, Refugee Research in an Era of Displacement was published by the University of Calgary Press. It is free open access at their website. I think the links will be posted. While we envisioned a dynamic web of global connections and relationships that would stimulate the development of new research partnerships and projects, when we evaluated the project with our partners, they said that networks needed more branches and fewer routes more regional capacity and less anchoring in the global north. And you'll notice that the cover of the book is that of a tree with multiple colorful branches, thanks to author Nurgis Kenefe for the painting. We learned from our partners working in low-income countries about the profound inequities in terms of refugee research. We saw the disparities, the lack of physical infrastructure, such as internet connectivity, computers, printers, libraries, their lack of human resources, such as graduate students, technical support, admin staff, and research funding, relying on funders from the North, unable to pursue their own research agendas. 
Lauren Landau, writing from South Africa about the challenges faced by researchers in, the, researchers in the South, starts his chapter with, power imbalances are intrinsic to every social relation. That is why we're so pleased to be co-hosting with Learn today's webinar, Localizing Knowledge Production, Shifting Power in Forced Migration Studies. I'm pleased to introduce my colleague and friend, James Milner, who will introduce the other presenters, Richard Shivakati, Amanda Coffey, and Rula El Rifai. James is an associate professor of political science at Carleton University. He was an active member of the RN, serving on the executive committee and developing a policy network. He further worked to advance the global capacity of refugee research and advocacy with a number of initiatives and has significantly advanced the field with his LEARN project, Local Engagement Refugee Research Network. James has been not only a productive scholar, but an activist academic seeking to make refugee research inclusive, responsive, and relevant to those who can best use it. Welcome, James. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, Ramadan Karim to those who are, are, who are celebrating. Um, many thanks, Susan. Thank you, Dina. Uh, it's a really wonderful opportunity to uh, have this conversation with members of the RRN and to sh share something of the work that LEARN has been doing uh, in recent years. Uh, Rachel has very kindly posted uh, links in the chat box uh, to learn more about LEARN uh, through our, uh, the, send us an email, uh, follow us on Twitter and visit our website and follow us on, on Facebook uh, if you so choose. Um, I'll be giving a little bit of background uh, to LEARN, what it is that we do and why it is that we do what we do. Um, I'll then be inviting uh, Richa Shivakati uh, to say a few words uh, uh, to introduce you to the research that we uh, conducted in partnership with IDRC, the International Development Research Centre. Um, Richa is currently a senior research associate at the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration at Ryerson University here in Canada. But she was the research officer on the LEARN IDRC collaboration from 2019 to 2020. Her research focuses on the governance of labor migration within Asia, particularly between the labor sending states in South Asia and Southeast Asia and labor receiving states in the Middle East. Um, once Richa has pr presented some of this research, which I'm delighted to say will be uh, published as, as, a, 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 as an article very soon uh, in the Journal of Refugee Studies, uh, uh, we're delighted for that. It will also feature as uh, the focus of a roundtable discussion at the meeting of the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration this July, uh, the morning of the 28th of July, where we'll hear again from Richa, uh, but also from Amanda Kofi, Rula El Rifai, and other colleagues. Uh, after Richa gives a presentation on the research, uh, we'll be hearing comments from Dr. Amanda Kofi, who is a research fellow at the Legon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy at the University of Ghana. Uh, her research focuses on refugees, diaspora, and the politics of mobility and the governance of migration, international organizations, and post-conflict uh, peacebuilding. Um, Amanda was recently elected as secretary of the Ethnicity, Nationalism, and Migration Studies section for the International Studies Association. We're very grateful to have Amanda's view on the research that uh, Richa will be presenting from the perspective of her work in and from the context of Ghana. We'll then have Rula El Rifai, uh, who will say a few words about IDRC's engagement in this and, and share some exciting news, the link to which I'll post in a moment. Uh, Rula is a senior program specialist with the Democratic and Inclusive Governance Division at IDRC. Her work over uh, more than two decades has supported civil society actors in the Arab world engaging and advocating for reform with a focus on forced displacement and youth civic engagement. And to say that Rula has been a champion of these issues within IDRC uh, for many years is, is an understatement and you'll see why in a moment. If I could get the next slide, please. I'm just gonna say a few words about uh, LEARN, who we are, how we started before I introduce the work uh, that we've been doing with IDRC. Um, like the RRN, uh, LEARN is, is very fortunate to be supported by a partnership grant from SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And our work really uh, has its origins in this critical work that the RRN was doing to more fully and critically understand the role of research in promoting protection and solutions, especially in the context uh, of the Global South. We started our work in 2018 
Um, and our partnership involves four Canadian universities, so Carleton, the University of Ottawa McGill, and York University, the Center for Refugee Studies at York University and other partners there. We have three international NGO partners, CARE, Oxfam, and Journalists for Human Rights. We're very fortunate to have an advisory committee that includes the Canadian Association of Refugee and Forced Migration Studies, includes the Humanitarian Response Network, includes Global Affairs Canada, includes IDRC, includes UNHCR, and includes the Network for Refugee Voices. And refugee participation is something I'll speak to in a moment. Through our Canadian partners, we support thematic working groups focusing on issues of protection, solutions, intersectionality, history, training, and knowledge mobilization. But the real heart and soul of LEARN is to be found in our geographic working groups. Um, we have geographic working groups in Kenya, Tanzania, Lebanon, and Jordan. And these geographic working groups are made up of national academic partners, refugee leadership communities within these countries. Uh, it includes uh, national NGOs and uh, part civil society partners in each of these four countries. We decided as a partnership very early on that to try and address some of the power asymmetries that were revealed by the RRN and, and many others working in this space, that we would consciously foreground our work in the needs and opportunities identified by our geographic working groups. And through that emphasis, what we have found is that we've come to focus very much on what we call the localization of knowledge production. This is the focus of what we're discussing today. This really takes the, the form of, of, of two areas of activity. One is really recognizing and, and, and empowering and supporting ecosystems of knowledge production. Uh, so where there are national academic partners in major refugee hosting countries in the global south, where they collaborate with civil society partners with refugee leadership ecosystems, how that creates a very particular kind of engagement um, around uh, identifying a new research agenda and the ability to generate new forms of knowledge. But second, the importance of then amplifying those perspectives into national, regional, and global discussions, both academic and policy focused. So really these two tracks of localized knowledge production, including national academics, refugee leaders, national civil society actors, and then amplifying that knowledge within and beyond the region. So through our work in, in collaborative research in capacity building and policy engagement and in public dialogue, we're really working to try and better understand and enhance the role of civil society in the functioning of the refugee regime, specifically with a view uh, to enhancing protection and solutions both with and for refugees. Very early in our work, and here I put a link to a story about the collaboration with IDRC, which leads into the research that Richa will be producing. From our very first meeting in 2018, the focus of our conversation revolved around questions of sustainability. How do we make sure that the work that we do has impact, but also is sustainable beyond the years of support that we enjoy from SHRP. And so I'm delighted that we've been collaborating with Rula and colleagues at IDRC since the very beginning of LEARN to try to address this question. So in the, uh, the story, I put the link in the box, you'll see that LEARN hosted, uh, uh, IDRC hosted LEARN partners for a meeting the day after LEARN was officially launched with a view to really trying to understand where and how we can address some of these asymmetries uh, of power within the research relationship and how more sustainable support can be provided and how the barriers faced by researchers in the global south can be part of this policy discussion. This work has continued uh, to uh, a webinar series that we host and there's a link there. I invite you to, learn, uh, to, to click on that link to learn more about that. Um, so the creation with IDRC uh, began with the research to which uh, Richa and Amanda will be speaking today. It's continued through our ongoing collaboration within our series, and it has extended into what is really a tremendously exciting opportunity, uh, which I'm putting in the chat box right now as I pat my head and I rub my tummy. Uh, Rula will be speaking to this, which is the, the launch of a call for proposals for funding for research chairs on displacement 
in East Africa and the Middle East. Now, this is really a, a tremendously exciting, tangible step towards uh, shifting power, localizing uh, knowledge production and all of those activities that we'll be discussing uh, into uh, major refugee hosting regions within the global south. Our hope is that this tangible investment is the beginning of structural change with resources being directly uh, attributed to research capacity within the global south that will be able to, um, to produce the kind of localized research that has been uh, so critically important in, in the early work uh, that we're going to be discussing today. So I'll be happy to answer questions about LEARN in the Q&A time. Uh, but with that, let me floor to Richa uh, to present uh, some of the early findings of this work, to Amanda to give a response, and then uh, to Rula uh, to provide a response and to give a of where IDRC's work is going. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, um, Richa. Hi, thank you, James, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be presenting our research that we did for the first phase of the project with IDRC that James just explained. Uh, James and I have written a paper um, on this, and then I'm today basically um, sharing the findings from the uh, interviews that were conducted. Um, so we started this research by wanting to uh, develop a more systematic understanding of the diversity of research centers across the global south, working on issues of refugees um, and forced displacement, and to survey the leadership of these centers to understand their challenges, and also how issues of success, imp uh, impact, and sustainability affected their work over time. So we began by drawing on the UNHCR data on forcibly displaced persons in different regions of the global south, which has hosted um, between 80 to 85 percent of the refugee population, uh, the world's displaced population over, um, you know, the uh, over any given year um, in the decade between 2008 and 2018. Uh, we then drew on publicly available data uh, to map existing research uh, centers working on migration and forced displacement that are located in the global south. And this map, through this map mapping exercise, we found that you know there are more than hundred. Uh, centers that are working on migration issues, but um, for those that work on um, that have uh, longer term um, research agendas on forced migration, there are about 27 or so. Um, so for the next step, we contacted research leaders from these uh, different centers and asked for interviews. And uh, between 2000, uh, sorry, October 2019 and January 2020, uh, we were able to conduct 22 in-depth semi-structured interviews with researchers based in Asia, South America, the Middle East, Africa, Australia, and North America. And from the 22, 20 were based in the Global South. Um, the interviewees were mostly university faculty or uh, research heads from either centers or networks. Um, and from these interviews, there are some prominent themes that have emerged, and that's what I'm sharing today. So one of the main challenges identified by researchers in the global uh, south was the challenge of securing um, securing um, sustained funding over time, especially multi-year core funding. This was really a challenge and um, they noted that universities usually have very little funding for research and governments usually do not want to fund topics related to forced displacement because they, th they see it as a temporary issue. Um, as a result, researchers have to rely on outside funding, and this has always been fraught with problems of competition, access, and various structural issues. Um, on a related um, issue that was brought up, it was uh, that the research salaries are usually quite low, so then researchers have to take up other jobs, like teaching at several colleges or consulting for international organization, and all of this really does not support a vibrant local research community, so it's been a difficulty that was shared quite a bit. On the issue of partnerships, especially with northern actors, um, 
um, the interview shared that they had both a good and bad relationships uh, over time. And uh, some noted that um, they usually have a bigger stake in the research agenda if they are contacted uh, from the very beginning of the project that, you know, when they're thinking of the project itself. But if they're contacted towards the end, and this happens sometimes because it's in the grant requirement or something, they find that the power relations are quite different and they might just end up collecting data and then exporting that data for partners in the global north to analyze and write. Um, sometimes um, researchers also shared that there was a sense of being exploited and they stated that the north-south academic imperialism is real. Um, they shared examples of how people outside the region come in, ask and use their networks and uh, contacts. They get the data, they publish um, you know, articles uh, from it, but they miss the local perspective. But then they are the ones that are seen as experts in that issue, you know, not the local researchers who've been working on it for a longer time. Um, and others, even, you know, they said that sometimes it's equal relation, sometimes it's a good uh, working relation, but um, the funding structure is that the North, they, it require Northern partners to be leading the projects and money is also channeled through them, even though the actors in the South are the ones that are doing most of the work and implementation of the projects. Um, and they noted that the relationship is sometimes seen as one of a supervisor and a supervisee or a research assistant, even though many of these researchers in the Global South have studied in the same universities in the North and then went back. Um, so that, that was an issue that was brought up. Um, but they said that despite all these issues, they decide to work together because it is a rare, a rare opportunity for funding. And sometimes it can be, um, training, capacity building, and also there's this possibility that there is going to be improved relations in the future for future work and projects. So, you know, they decide to work together uh, despite knowing these issues. Um, another issue that is important is setting the research agenda, not only of individual research projects, but also for um, the research center, you know, over a longer term. And this is really difficult because it's dependent on funding and they're always looking for funding. So um, if they're working with Northern partners or other partners, they, they come with their own agenda and their own research interest. So it's difficult, um, um, to, you know, challenge this and to nurture um, and create a longer term autonomous research for the research centers in the global south themselves. Um, lastly, because of all these funding issues and the need to constantly work with others, there's often a mismatch between the research that is produced and uh, the one, the research that is needed in the lo local context. So many informants, um, they found that the current emphasis on funding um, is for research that answers European questions, not local one, especially, you know, given the um, uh, area you're in kind of. Um, on issues related to, to success, impact and sustainability of research centers in the global south, we wanted to understand um, what it was that, you know, helped them become successful uh, and such. And they noted that their intimate knowledge of the local um, context is what is, um, you know, sought out by the partners. And this is done to advance and also legitimize their own research. Uh, so this is important and needed for um, sustainability of an institute. It is, um, they said it's really important that they diversify research funding, research personnel, and this really supports the longer term um, investment of the research institute. And even though, you know, projects can have life cycles, the diversification ensures that the institute sustains over time. Um, on the issue of impact, it was interesting because researchers found that, you know, it's usually beyond just monitoring schemes. Um, it's a longer term impact that is more important. You know, if the government listens to you or if there are tangible re results in the ground, that is more satisfying uh, in the local, local context. 
So based on these kind of um, themes that emerged, um, some important points for us to uh, consider on why the production of localized knowledge is important is that the key message from respondents was that it's imperative to develop funding channels that can support researchers in the global south without them having to rely on northern partners who are currently seen as gatekeepers. Uh, the existing structures have been criticized for its colonial approach and that pro propagates um, exclusionary practices and also unequal power relationships. So the sense of being exploited as seen as research assistants rather than real partners um, becomes a real problem in the longer term. Um, also, the importance of researchers in the South being able to define independent research agendas that respond to local priorities is really important. Um, this should be different from the priorities of the funders in the global North. And um, the importance also of investing future generations of forced migration scholars is really important um, that you know, could be supported. Um, Another issue is just how success and impact are perceived. You know, um, sometimes it's wider than um, than you know an academic journal article or something. They they want the involvement of more actors in academics, but also national NGOs, civil society organizations, uh, refugee led. Uh, initiatives, this can be seen as a knowledge ecosystem that James talked about a little. And this really supports the local knowledge co-production in the longer term. Um, and also just supporting this localized knowledge um, research can support the heterogeneous uh, local in different parts of the world. And um, this can you know, change the discourse currently in um, in the North uh, by providing a bottom-up um, evidence. And also um, researchers really shared this uh, thing that partnerships should not always be, be between North and South partners. Like South and South is really important and they have you know, sometimes similar local context and this can really support mutual learning. So if, they are, you know, if researchers in the global South are able to have direct access, um, to funding, then they are able to set their own re research agenda. And also we could see more horizontal research partnerships between South, South um, institutes. Um, sorry, one last point. Uh, so basically, yeah, the horizontal research between South and South um, research centers would um, take us away from the current discourses that are more Northern and Eurocentric um, for migration studies in uh, general. So with that, actually, I'm gonna conclude. I think I'm right a little bit over time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mel. Thank you very much, Richa. I appreciate that. Um, and and as, uh, as we said, we'll, we'll have a chance to discuss this more at ISFM. So this is a teaser of what we're going to be discussing on the 28th of July. Um, Amanda, over to you for your thoughts on, on how, these, uh, how these points, how these observations, how the finding of the research resonates uh, with your experiences and your context in, uh, in Ghana and in West Africa. Amanda, good to see you. Over Amanda, I, uh, speaking to the question of challenges of internet connectivity, uh, I think we're experiencing- Thank you very much, James, and uh, thank you, Rika, for the presentation. I know it's a very extensive uh, research. Amanda, if you if you're able, I, I think it, it may help with the bandwidth if if uh, if your if your camera is off. If we can try it with your camera off and see if that helps, please. Are you able to hear me now? We can hear you now. Thank you. Go ahead.
Hi there. I think we seem to have um, we seem to have lost uh, Amanda. Um, what I think we'll do uh, in the interest, we'll try and get her back. Um, but as we're trying to get Amanda back onto the line, uh, uh, Rula, can we go to you uh, with your perspectives from IDRC, which speaks very much to these points that Richa raised in her presentation? Uh, Rula, let me give the floor to you and we'll try and get Amanda back on the line. Rula, go ahead, please. Thank you so much, uh, James. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the Refugee Research uh, Network. Thanks for LEARN for organizing the webinar. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with Richa, whom we worked before, and, and, and Susan and, and James and everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, let me briefly, I want to stick to my five minutes. Um, so IDRC recently just launched, I think about two weeks ago, a, a call for proposal to establish two research chairs in the Middle East and two research chairs in East Africa. Uh, I will talk about how the research chairs that we established uh, connect to the uh, um, theme of localization, the theme of this webinar. Uh, and let me just note that this is an initiative that was designed as part of a broader uh, engagement by IDRC and hopefully many others. Uh, that includes many other elements than the research chairs. Uh, the call, um, uh, so let me start by saying that localization uh, is not a foreign practice for IDRC. IDRC is a crown corporation whose mandate is to support research and researchers in the global south to identify solutions to the challenges that they face and try to impact policy at multiple levels. We seek to connect local processes to the global arena. Uh, so empowering global south researchers as part of a localization agenda uh, is really part of our DNA, and I always use that metaphor. And, and, and this is what IDRC tries to do, and we are 50 years young, uh, 50 years plus young. Uh, but as Richa said in the research that she conducted, the challenges of asymmetries of powers remain, and the research shows that much work needs to be done on localiz localization of knowledge production on forced migration in the Global South. So the call does aim to fill some of the gaps which Richa and others have identified. Specifically about the call, not for me to repeat what you guys can read uh, online, and I think James posted the actual call for proposal. So there's all the details about the eligibility, eligibility criteria and the selection criteria. Uh, but let me just speak about a couple of elements that do strongly reflect the localization approach. One, the thematic focus is not dictated by us. Uh, it is demand driven. It is based on locally identified and led research agenda that must be relevant to the region. Two, in the selection criteria, and, and I know that James spoke a lot about that, we, and, and Richa as well, we put a lot of focus on the issue of sustainability. Part of localization, I believe, is strengthening the institutional knowledge infrastructure and landscape. So like others, we do look beyond the project and beyond the IDRC funding. And our aim is for the research chairs to be sustainable and continue and thrive beyond our direct engagement. Three, if you look at the selection criteria, you will see that there are three main interconnected pillars to the call. Uh, and they all directly relate to a localization agenda. The first is about excellence in research and mentoring a younger generation of scholars. Localization is about influencing policies based on knowledge that is generated by Global South uh, researchers. Uh, a second uh, pillar is the, 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 the need of direct connection between the academia and the research chair to community and civil society research and initiatives. And this clearly in, includes engagement with refugees and host communities, and the aim is to amplify their voices in multiple fora, from local to national to global. A third pillar is direct and regular engagement with policy communities and processes. 
uh, at all levels. We aim for the research chairs to influence policies and policy processes, bringing local voices and realities and knowledge to the policy making and programmatic interventions. Uh, so you will see more of this in the call itself. I'm happy to answer any additional questions. But let me just end by making three remarks about some challenges the research chairs will, will likely face, as well as ourselves, as we work to promote a localization uh, of knowledge production agenda. Uh, I don't want to simplify it. Uh, it is, but let me say, uh, it, it, it may be easier to actually produce local knowledge than it is to influence local, no, local, national, and global stakeholders to actually use this knowledge as a basis of their act, for their actions and policies. Um, and, and maybe there is much originally that we don't access, and I hope we can have that part of the discussion. We don't access some of the knowledge that's generated because of language issues and because of lack of translation. But the point I'm trying to make is that there is an instinctive preference by local, national, and global stakeholders. There is a culture globally that favors Western knowledge products, uh, which tend to be the most cited anyway. And so our hope is that the research chairs will begin to change that equation and those deeply ingrained perceptions and bring value to local knowledge production. The second challenge I put out is about academia and, 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 and academia globally, which does not, uh, not only in the global south, actually in the global north, which, the, which, which does not value research that is strongly policy and community engaged. And for example, the issue of granting promotions and tenures uh, is, is part of that challenge. I've worked uh, for, for 22 years at IDRC and I've seen that happen time and again. The field of forced migration, forced displacement cannot be studied or approached from a pure academic perspective. So again, we hope that the research chairs will help again contribute to changing the equation, influence the academia landscape, and be a strong example about how academia can act as a strong nexus between community and policy, and maybe push for that type of acad engage academia to be more valued in specific acad academic processes and other. And, and final challenge I will quickly say is more of us, uh, it's more on us as a funder and a donor. Uh, we do need to work and influence, to work with and influence many other donors agendas to buy into the localization agenda and act on it. Uh, we will certainly strive to do that. Uh, I mean, the, the premise of this is collaborating with other donor partners will only help scale up our collective work and attain greater impact. So we plan to do this as well, uh, goes without saying, in collaboration with our research chairs and others. So on this note, I will end and thank everyone and look forward to the discussion. Thank, thank you very much, Rula. I think that last point is really cool, this, this notion that two research chairs in East Africa and two research chairs in the Middle East on their own won't bring about this kind of structural change, but it can, be, it can serve to precipitate this kind of change in support with other donors. And of course, this is at a time where UK funding for these kinds of initiatives has recently been cut. So it's, it's launching this initiative in a, in a challenging time, but uh, it's, it's important uh, to begin. Uh, we do have Amanda back on the line, and I believe I believe Amanda uh, speaks to us without her camera on with a hope that that uh, enables uh, the bandwidth to support her. So Amanda, let me give the floor to you, please. So thank you very much. Um, can you hear me now? Can hear you yes. fine. Perfect, okay. So um, thank you for the presentation and thanks for the invitation to participate in today's webinar. Um, Rika, I think you've um, outlined extensively uh, the issues and, and I'm not going to belabor the point, but I'm just going to kind of speak to two uh, main issues uh, that you've addressed and how it pertains to us at the University of Ghana and also uh, on the larger scale uh, with the uh, West African sub-region. 
And um, as the paper that you shared with me rightly indicated, sadly, uh, there is only one center in the whole of West Africa that deals with migration and it's not even uh, forced migration. And so uh, it's, it's the broad uh, area of, of migration, which is located at the University of Ghana. Um, but I, I, I want to uh, bring us back to the point about your conclusion that there is a need for a long-term strategy, uh, a long-term approach uh, to dealing with this, and, and also what James just uh, noted about the fact that establishing two uh, uh, research centers here and there are really not enough, but again, it starts the conversation for us and also draw attention to this needed uh, area of research in refugee studies. Now, the issue is that um, we, we're here talking about long-term approaches, but um, here uh, on the ground, and also particularly with the, the phenomenon that we deal with, and as you rightly noted, refugees or forced migration is a temporary issue. It's considered temporary. And so for policymakers who control the purse and, and kind of fund our research and, and, and provide us with the resources that we need, anytime you approach them, uh, that this is uh, a much needed area for us to concentrate on or also pay attention to. There is the question of, um, they, they are not here for long. So what are you studying about them and how are they going to uh, contribute to the society in which we live in. And so there is this conundrum for researchers who focus on uh, uh, forced migration and also how uh, you approach uh, authorities to buy in uh, to the idea of having specific university programs, specific centers and institutes dedicated to this issue. And this ties into um, uh, something that I observed when I, I returned from uh, my, my studies in Canada and uh, joined the University of Ghana, this shift in location of, uh, of scholars and their focus on forced migration. And I'll give you the example of Ghana. So um, when the Liberian refugees uh, were in Ghana, um, that was in the early 1990s, they were located in Accra, the capital. And so most scholars within the University of Ghana, which is in Accra, are then started focusing on refugees and it was on the Liberian refugees. Now, um, it's, 20, it's in the uh, 21st century, 2020, uh, supposedly uh, the Liberian refugee uh, situation has ended because UNHCR says so, government of Ghana said so, and yet we have Liberian refugees there. So how do I sell this idea that I still want to study Liberian refugees and their presence in Ghana and the issues that are pertinent to them and how uh, together we can resolve it? Now the Ivorian refugees also arrive. They are now located at a different part of the country, which is very far away from Accra. And within that location is another university. So you see that uh, faculty members and researchers in the University of Ghana are no longer doing anything on refugees. And if you want to find out current scholars studying refugees, then you have to go to the University of Cape Coast. This is aided by the UNHCR itself uh, that also sometimes try to use the community in which the refugees are located as part of resources to uh, 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 learning about the refugees. So the UNHCR and other international organizations who also sometimes uh, pay for this uh, uh, research focus on the location of the refugees and the uh, uh, institutions that are there to use. So then you also see scholars shifting towards where we say the money is or where the refugees are. So you kind of follow them. Um, and then um, the, my third point is um, the politics of establishing uh, research centers. Um, it, uh, tied within that is the, the, the whole issue of the political economy of doing it. 
uh, to, to my utmost surprise, I, I, I joined the University of Ghana and unlike some uh, uh, Northern institutions like Canadian institutions where if, if you are in a department and you are able to create a new uh, program or you are even just um, a course for a semester to run, you, would, you, you just need your departmental head to okay it. It's not like that here. It's a whole National Council for Tertiary Education would have to give you accreditation to run a course within an existing program and not to mention the creation of centers or institutions. And so that leads me to, to what extent are uh, the governments uh, that are playing host to the refugees really interested in the refugee issue and are willing to uh, fund it and also to open space for scholars within the local uh, uh, space to contribute to that. And so that you can have uh, in place uh, local scholars who are engaged in this so that we are not asking for um, um, the global north when they come in, sometimes they look like an unoccupied space uh, it's very difficult to even find local scholars engaged in that area. And, and, and then it's, it, it turns the dynamics of this power relationship. So I think that it, um, we also need to look at, at the local level, what is actually going on there? To what extent are, are, are the local scholars and researchers and institutions and centers independently and able to uh, uh, conduct some of these research with the support of their own government. And I will end with an interesting experience of mine. So um, I think it was last 2019, the African Union declared 2019 the year of returnees and refugees. And for me, I think it was a very exciting moment for uh, 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 scholars and research opportunities for, uh, for Africans. And fortunately for us, uh, my president, president of Ghana, was the chair. And, and, and I, I, I wrote and, and tried to meet some uh, members around him, the extent to which we could use that as an opportunity for Ghana to become a hub for learning about this, some of these issues. And, and nobody responded. Everybody was just interested in diaspora. And it was the diaspora and because what is it that the diaspora was bringing? And so the whole theme that included refugees, refugees was dropped and it was returnees and diaspora. And because everybody was chasing where the money is coming from and what uh, uh, they were going to get out of it. So I think we've missed opportunities at the local level, primarily because we've not been able to center this, uh, uh, this area of research. And it is also because we tend to see false migration as very temporary. And so even for scholars in the area of uh, uh, false migration, uh, it cannot be your daytime research area. You need to do other research as well. If you want to grow in the academy, if you want to get access to project funding, if you want to be able to establish yourself within the institutions that you find yourself. So I think I will leave it here and say thank you very much, uh, uh, James and the team uh, to York and at Carlton uh, for organizing this and also uh, for, for the intent behind it in trying to uh, uh, further establish this challenge that scholars within uh, the Global South face and how we can better have a relationship of complementarity and not one of asymmetry power where uh, one is kind of dominant and one is kind of uh, serving as, uh, uh, to quote, um, where Africa or the Global South is seen as a place where you test your theory. So thank you very much and um, sorry about my bandwidth. <laughs> No, Amanda, thank you very much. That was really helpful and very powerful. And, and thank you for your patience with the technology. But the points that you made are, are, are so critical, especially around this notion that, um, you know, so long as governments are, are in the narrative of display, notwithstanding the fact that the average duration of a refugee situation is now 20 years, the fact that governments remain in this narrative of uh, 
refugees being a short-term issue, uh, that we're really, um, you know, we're, 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 we're stuck in this, in this, in this cycle. Um, I'm going to now uh, pass back to, uh, to Dina, who's going to mo moderate discussion. Uh, uh, notwithstanding the end of remote learning for my nine-year-old upstairs at 11 o'clock and my um, uh, responsibilities to feed him, uh, we're going to stay on for an extra five minutes so that there's a chance for us to have at least 10 minutes of discussion and, and to dive into this in a very rich way. So, Dina, back to you and my Yes, um, thank you so much, Richa, Rola, Amanda, and James for a very um, engaged discussion and like reflections on, on actual work and not just in an academic ivory tower. I always uh, crave similar, similar work. So now we're gonna open it for discussion. We have, as James um, mentioned, we're gonna try to extend it for five more minutes after the hour for, um, a longer conversation. I already received one question um, from um, patients. Are there plans to establish centers in West Africa in the near future? I assume that's targeted at me. And let me just quickly say, yes, we are thinking of deepening our engagement in the two regions and possibly enlarging to other regions, as well as bringing in other components, such as support to refugee-led initiatives, such as support to good old traditional long-term research that is comparative, multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral, as well as a, a lot of focus on policy dialogue. So this is in the works as we speak, and, and hopefully this will happen in the next period. Go ahead, Jean. I, I might just follow up on that very quickly. So the question I think is also, uh, given the tremendous need that was identified, why start in East Africa and the Middle East? Um, and I think this was a real challenge that Rich and I faced first phase of this research. You know, our expectation was in doing this mapping of where research centers currently exist, that there was a hope that, you know, that there'd be a specific need that could be addressed. But of course, the need was quite widespread. And so the, the, the work really uh, tried to be driven by, by evidence. What we did is we looked at the regions where there was the highest level of, of, of displacement over a 10-year period uh, in uh, different data sources. So where was there the highest level of displacement at a regional level over a 10-year period with the lowest commensurate number of research centers, uh, but yet where there was a foundation from which we could build. And this is how East Africa and the Middle East were identified as regions, notwithstanding the tremendous need in West Africa, in America, in South Asia, in Southeast Asia, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, you know, in not only in the global South, but in the global East as well. So the need is tremendous. And so this is what hope is that these research chairs serve as a proof of concept uh, and, and as a way of trying to attract interest and to make the case of investments, not just in these two regions, but in other regions as well. Great. Um, I have a question from George. N nice to hear from you, George. I hope it's uh, nice in Vancouver. Uh, can we hear of more examples of refugee-led work and how to connect with them to advance research and policy? And then after that, we have a couple more questions as well. So maybe nutshell answers okay nut nutshell answers how to engage with uh, refugee-led uh, researchers um that it, send us an email at learn and we're happy to follow that up but um you know i'm delighted that something that learn is doing in partnership with colleagues at the economies program at the refugee study center at oxford and through the learn network is that we're developing a refugee-led research on refugee-led responses in east Africa and the middle east i think there's been a real focus just as there's been this discussion of power asymmetries in research relationships, we've seen this growth in literature of researchers who have been part of the research process, but also subcontracted. The, uh, there's a, the, in, the, in the journal Antipod, there was a great piece on subcontracting act. So anyone who's interested in how to uh, connect with refugee researchers, so long as that connection is being made at the design stage in the research, and I, here I also know uh, Christina clark Kazak's webinar on research ethics in the RN uh, uh, session that I, I commend to you, but do reach out to learn at carlton.ca and we're happy to help. Great, we have a few questions. We have Nicholas and then Melissa and then a few more. 
we'll try to cover as much as we can. Go ahead, Nicholas. Okay, thank you so much um, for you know what you have just uh, said, James. I I had a question related to um, regions such as Southern Africa. Um, I'm a historian of Africa uh, based at the University of Minnesota uh, in the US, and my research also you know focuses on borders and uh, border conflicts as well in everyday life. So I was wondering, uh, you know, in terms of um, extending or expanding the regions uh, from East Africa as well to think about uh, countries such as Mozambique and Zimbabwe in the recent times where we have, uh, you know, displacement caused by uh, civil conflict, um, for example, in the border regions of Tanzania and Mozambique, and uh, thinking also of refugees, uh, you know, as a result of natural uh, disasters. So I was wondering if that could be also, you know, a reason to think about broadening up um, um, where research centers are being established. Thank you. Does anyone want to res respond or comment? We have a few more questions as well coming up. Can we have five minutes left? Uh, maybe I can say a, a Quick word on that, also on the question of internal displacement, and then Richa and Amanda, I, I'd, I'd welcome your thoughts on it as well. But you know, very very briefly, the the fact that um, IDR has taken as its terminology looking at forced displacement, uh, you know, this looks at the you know the the outside of uh, the the specific category of refugee from the 1951 convention, and looks at other drivers of displacement. But I would agree with the general point that um, where there is greater conceptual clarity, uh, it is easier to advance the political economy uh, of knowledge production. Um, and, and, and on Amanda's point of asking governments to engage with, with issues on, on categories where there is ambiguity, that that uh, leads to greater concerns about um, you know, political obligations that come from that. Um, on the question of research relating to internal displacement, um, you know, that, that it is, you know, something that, for example, our Kenya working group, some of the works in, in Ethiopia has that, that the, the question of displacement in the Middle East always comes with, with ambiguities. So it is happening. But where I think that some of the, the, the strongest uh, research, Refugee Survey Quarterly uh, has, uh, is, is, is working on a, on, a, on a special issue around internal displacement with a specific intention to identify the research Global South on issues of internal displacement. This has also been a focus of the Secretary General's high-level panel, and Beth Ferris at Georgetown has been doing some incredible work on that. So I, I, I recommend uh, that work to you. But uh, let me uh, mute myself now and, and ask uh, if Richa or Amanda want to comment on the issue of the, 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 the nomenclature of displacement versus uh, what research is. I mean, we have still a few questions and time is precious. So um, maybe I can read a few questions and uh, we can try to get um, through as many of those. Like maybe each each guest can give uh, a one minute response to try to catch it as much as possible for, for the remaining questions. So Melissa is asking, to what extent has research on internal displacement specifically been feasible in Global South institutions? And is this a question that the LEARN will look into? Were there any research centers focused on the internal displacement? The other question from Celestine is, to what extent does the research address the root causes of displacement? And then there is a question from Act. Uh, I work on impact of family loss, um, uh, and uh, and like he's. It seems that he or she are looking for collaboration. I'm gonna read that a bit to save the question to save time for the questions. Uh, oh, hi there. Uh, and uh, what are the plans for capacity building for refugee researchers and supporting greater refugee involvement? That's a question from Mohammed. Uh, wow, a lot of questions. That's great. Uh, do you have any plans in the project to bring together the research centers you interviewed in the Global South to have a wider discussion on the issue mentioned? That's from Elena and then Sarah. How can we foster the uptake of local knowledge at the international level through SDGs? The Global Compact of Refugee is good, but parallel initiative. 
Uh, Rachel, thank you so much for trying to respond to some of the questions by sharing uh, resources. That's very helpful. So if anything that Rachel is not responding to through um, links, maybe we can address. Th there you have it. <laughs> you can answer all those questions. Or uh, I would also recommend including, uh, Rachel will share, learn, contact information for any follow-ups as well. Risha, uh, Rola, um, Amanda and James, maybe one minute responses. I know it's difficult because there were so many questions, but maybe just capture the essence. Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer a few of them. Um, so on the issue of internal displacement, it was uh, quite hard to find uh, you know, centers that do specific work only on internal displacement. I think even data for internal displacement is quite difficult. Um, so I, I don't remember off the top of my head, like if there were specific ones, it was more migration. And, and then, you know, they could be doing internal displacement or refugee here and there, but that was not the main focus for the most part. Um, on the, someone asked about like, if there is a plan to bring all the research centers together, all of that, that's quite challenging. I know there've been some networks that have tried to do that. The um, uh, Susan McGrath, the Re Refugee Research Network uh, brings together quite a few of the um, research centers together and have um, meetings and such, but also the IAFSM conference that is happening in Kana, I think. Um, in 28 July, James has written. So that, that could be a place where, um, you know, more researchers from the global south uh, are usually attending and presenting. So um, that is one. Uh, a few of you have asked for the paper. Uh, we don't have uh, the full draft um, ready, but it has been, um, it is being worked on at the final uh, last leg of it, and it should be out at the Jeff Journal of Refugee Studies. If you are interested, you can um, email learn, um, or I can write my email as well, and then we'll be happy to share that. So I'll let Rula answer a few questions and James and Amanda. Uh, thank you, Richa. Very briefly, yes, the, the research chairs are designed in a way that they will be working together, collaborating, that there will be some mutual learning and actually learn James and Jennifer and other learn uh, team members will be contributing to that process. I just wanna say one quick point about, and on a positive note about the role of funders. Yes, the power asymmetries remain and there's a big problem in how donors sometimes try to impose their agendas. But again, uh, let me bring my hat of 22 years of working in this field to say, I have certainly seen in the last certainly five years plus, there's a strong awareness about how to decolonize knowledge. And you can see a lot of that in the literature. And it starts with the awareness and, and then it continues into, we need to do something about it. And, and I will say there are no perfect answers in terms of how to decolonize knowledge and how can Southern actors actually lead the agenda. There are several approaches and modalities that work. One of them is the ecosystems approach that we are testing, trying to test and understand what makes it work or not. But the idea is to work collaboratively. One actor alone can't do it. Um, and how can we promote South-South learning? How can we promote a multiplicity of actors working together to actually make a difference and impact uh, on a global arena, on the Global Refugee Forum, on UNHCR practices, on donor practices, uh, so that in the future, this local knowledge and local voices are more um, kind of taken into consideration and I think guide the agenda. Thank you so much, everyone. We will take if Amanda has any final thoughts in under a minute, that would be great, Amanda. I just want to say that uh, the issue of internally displaced persons is, is it's something that is considered more as an internal issue for the state. And, and, and it is even seen here that uh, the issues that we are discussing does sometimes uh, does not include them. And the states, for example, Nigeria has a very high population of our center or their, we, we, we look through, it was very difficult to find a scholar saying that this is my focus area. So it is, it is how we've operationalized 
uh, these uh, issues and, and the attempt to distinguish the various categories has also contributed to who is funded to study which category of people. So we need to take another look at it. And if it's about the global South, this is one of the issues, localizing uh, knowledge. Uh, the issue of IDPs is very, very prominent in West Africa, for example. So if we are going to establish research centers, how are we going to then determine it based on the number, the numbers and which categories are we interested in? So we need to also take another look at this uh, category of false migrants and, and, and the research that is being done around it. But sadly, um, I am yet to come across any uh, center in the sub-region that focuses on IDPs. And also the issue of stateless person, which is emerging in the sub-region as an issue of interest, uh, yet uh, they haven't, the ECOWAS has not even been able to sign its own protocol on stateless persons to be able to move the agenda forward. So there are a lot of issues. And like I said, these are humble beginnings uh, that Len and, and the other team in IDRC is doing. And so once we start this, then being able to expand it to other uh, groups of uh, um, false migrants in the sub-region as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And what an engaged uh, conversation. Are you able to see my shared screen? Hello. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, so uh, just to wrap up and thank you so much for our guests for agreeing to stay uh, a bit longer um, and for our attendees, just to quickly wrap up, uh, we are gonna be sharing all the resources um, that was shared today in the chat, room, chat um, box in a follow-up email uh, stay, and stay tuned to also the recording of, uh, of this webinar. On another note, there's an upcoming webinar in late uh, uh, May, the, the date and time to be determined, but it's going to be led by our very own Julie Young here. So we're all excited about this. Um, and don't forget to sign up to our digest. We're going to share again our, our contact information and social media handles in the follow up email for the for learn and for the RN. And thank you so much for all those who attended and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, everybody.